Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thanks, Alison, for setting this up. Very pleased to be here. Um, I'm, I, I don't know exactly what to expect from this audience. I, I hear it's very mixed, so um, throw rotten tomatoes or something if I'm talking uninteresting stuff. And the other thing I need to say is I have to run off pretty much after my talk to catch a flight home. I'll be in deep shit if I don't make it home. And um, so please excuse that. So, but uh, that means ask your questions throughout. So I'm happy to take questions. If, if you ask too many questions, then I'll just skip over some of the contents. That should be fine. OK, so my, my area is I, I'm an operating systems person. I've been developing operating systems, particularly for security and safety applic critical applications for the last 20 years. And for the last 10, 15 years, we've develop this SEO4 system, which is the, the world's first operating system with a mathematical proof of implementation correctness and security enforcement. And I'll talk about that. Um, and the reason I'm here, I guess, is because this is, to, to me, um, safety and security is one of the critical things you need for autonomous driving, among a few other things, and I think SEL4 is a good platform for that. So basically, this is a pitch about SEL4 a bit more. It sort of tells you, the idea is to tell you about what, what it really is and what it can do. So first, um, we all heard about car hacking, etc. So what's the story behind that? Um, one of the issues in cars is you have um, networks on the car, uh, in particular CAN network. In, in, mo in more recent cars, you increasingly have Ethernet. And in particular, with, if you have a CAN network, there's no security whatsoever. So if anything gets to talk to the CAN bus, the, the one that controls the engine, etc., then you're in control of the car, and there's no stopping. And one of the problems is, OK, there is other stuff that are run on different networks, but somewhere they have to be bridged. And so if you get onto some of these other networks, you have potentially the chance to break through and uh, get on the CAN bus and then control the vehicle. And how do you get on the other uh, networks? Well, they're wirelessly um, networked. And that, for, for, for a number of reasons. And there's, of course, increasing reasons for doing so. What's the problem with that? Well, obviously, anything that has a wireless network connectivity can potentially be attacked from the outside. And uh, this always happens if I put my slides, take my slides on a different laptop, um, the font stuff up. But um, basically, there is suddenly a hugely increased attack surface where you can be attacked from nearby cars, from passengers, or even remotely from any place via the uh, cellular interface. And there's really three major attack vectors. Insecure crypto protocols that um, fail to secure the communication adequately. Um, amazingly, reusing crypto keys is still a um, past, nice pastime people try to exercise. Obviously, shipping multiple devices with the same key is just professional malpractice, but that doesn't stop people from doing it. Um, th this is one thing that just shouldn't happen. And then the, the one I'm particularly interested in, and excuse the font mismatch, is um, software vulnerabilities. I'm not a protocol guy. I don't know anything more about protocol and probably less than many of you, but um, I am I'm a software guy and in particular um, focus of my work is eliminating software vulnerabilities. And of course, one nice example has just recently appeared of that, the, the Blueborn attack, which is notable for the fact that it works across a range of operating systems with completely different source code bases by basically finding enough vulnerabilities that it can attack it across platforms and implementation. That's pretty impressive, but in a way not very surprising. Why? Because the main, number one reason is complexity. Right? So there's a software rule of thumb that quality software, which means basically to sort of um, good industrial QA standards engineered, has one to five bucks per thousand lines of code. And that's quality software. And um, to be honest, the majority of software in cars does not qualify as quality software under that definition. So you, you have a reasonably high number of bucks to be expected. And of course, um, 
that means inherently the more you increase your complexity, the more bugs you will have and therefore the more vulnerabilities. And there's a number of drivers for this complexity increase and I don't need to talk much about that. It shows more features, et cetera. So if you compare that to the Bluetooth protocol stack, this is just this one protocol stack and it's of the order of 100,000 lines. So I'll multiply that with um, one to five bucks per thousand lines. You can, you know, there's literally um, of the order of 100 bucks or hundreds of bucks in that one Bluetooth stack. So it's hardly surprising that people, people find multiple exploits. And the problem is in almost any operating system, the Bluetooth stuff runs in the kernel, so it's privileged, and once you compromise it, you can compromise the complete system and there's nothing stopping you. And of course, if we then look at the typical operating system, say something like Linux or Windows, which are, consist of tens of millions of lines of code, you know they have thousands, if not ten thousands of bugs. And so the typical expectation is in, in critical code like operating system, somewhere between one and 20% of your bugs are actually security critical. And I estimate it's probably closer to the 20 than the 1%. So this means literally thousands of uh, security vulnerabilities. And that's the main reason why our enterprise IP, IT doesn't work. And of course, what I wouldn't want is to see the same sort of failure of security in autonomous vehicles, because that could be really dangerous. Um, it took the Linux community a long time, but finally it's starting to live up to the fact that this is just not the way to, it, to do it. So this is um, about a year and a half old after the 2016 kernel summit, where the Ars Technica article summarized it as unsafe at any clock speed. <laughs> and it really is. From the security point of view, the Linux kernel is fundamentally broken. And don't think for a second that Windows is any better. This is just the nature of these systems. It's impossible to get these right. So the fact is they will break if you use them and then you're the enemies on the platform. And that doesn't only apply to the operating systems, but of course these are the most, um, w where you can cause the most damage. If you compromise the operating system, then everything is open. And now of course, when we talk about autonomy, we have an inherent increase in complexity. You just have massively more functionality that's implemented in software, so your software complexity necessarily increases. You can't create functionality out of nothing, and therefore your susceptibility to software failures increases massively. And um, that's one aspect, and the other is that compared to traditional cars, functionality on an autonomous vehicle just inherently is more integrated. Uh, all these components, they really have to talk to each other and that goes from the, the uh, external world facing wireless networks to the, the security and safety critical part of that control your car. So you have a hugely attack, uh, increased attack surface and we, see, we need better ways of managing that. So this was one reason for the failures sheer software complexity. The second reason has to do with um, what's driving business. And again, this is not specific to automotive. This applies to a lot of things. Um, if you're in any sort of business, typically the number one priority is you want to achieve the features you're after. And you want to do that at as little cost as possible, and you want to minimize your time on market. Right? These are the things people care. And then they may care about a few other things, and right at the bottom typically is security. I hope I'm not insulting too many people here, but this is just the way the industry works. And if you look at sort of what people know about the typical software developer, particularly in the embedded space, they typically have a university degree where they learn programming, um, often as a side effect of being mechanical or electrical engineers. Um, they typically know something about the application domain, they, particularly in the embedded space, they typically know something about hardware, they know, may know about a few other things, and maybe they heard of security. And typically that's about the, the degree of expertise. So given that, it's hardly surprising that these systems fall apart if you just look at them uh, a bit carefully. 
And the third reason for failures, and this one is particularly exhibited in the automotive space, is that people tend to worry about security, uh, safety, but don't understand that security is a prerequisite to safety. So automotive and other industries tend to be driven by classical safety culture, which is based on the assumption that A, failures are random, because it's, it all comes out of hardware, and hardware failures do tend to have this um, randomness behavior. Um, all, all safety standards I've seen have this assumption that you can keep your failure rates low by having disciplined processes. And um, my claim is for software, this is just not good enough. And then the other is that multiple failures are independent. And if you think of sort of the typical say, classical safety scenario of a system where software is fairly irrelevant, then that's typically a good assumption, right? This thing may fail, that thing may fail. The chance of them failing both at the same time is basically the product of the, of the probabilities and therefore infinitely, almost infinitely uh, small. Now for software, that is totally not the case. Software failure is not deterministic. If you have found a vulnerability, you can exploit it the same way every time, totally deterministically. Failure rates are high, as I argued before. And failures are not independent. If you found one bug and got a foothold in, then you look for the next one, and you can exploit them systematically in series and therefore gain more power. So the, all the um, techniques and processes developed for managing safety in classical engineering simply don't work with software. And I think the auto industry by and large is still working on trying to understand that. If I talk to people in the auto industry, some get it and others don't. And um, that goes up to high level management. Okay, feel free to throw eggs or whatever if you disagree. So the, the, the bottom line here is, in such a system, if you don't have security, you don't have safety. Because if I can attack a car, particularly an autonomously driving one, then I can control it in any way I want. Or if I successfully attack it, then can I control it in any way I want. And um, any safety measures built into it are completely irrelevant because obviously I can always drive it into a wall. The human can do it and therefore the autonomy can do it if it's sufficiently compromised. So if you don't have real cybersecurity on your vehicles, they will not be safe. And of course, if you think of autonomous vehicles where presumably there is thousands of vehicles running the same software, so you successfully attack one, you can successfully attack all of them, you can mount a concerted attack and create a fair bit of disaster. Okay, so what do people do about this? The typical um, answers I hear, okay, well, we know how to do that, which is patch, right? So you have a 10 million lines of code base that has 10,000 lines of, at uh, 10,000 bucks. Someone hacks it, you identify it, takes a lot of work typically, so you now have 10,000 bucks and one known vulnerability. And then you develop a patch and apply that. So you um, have 10,000 minus one box. And then you do some maintenance, and you're back to the beginning. So this patch and pray cycle simply doesn't work. It doesn't work in IT security, in enterprise IT. And it works even less in the cyber physical world. All right. So there's lots of people that sell you firewalls for the cars. And of course, a firewall solves our problems, right? So you just put this firewall there and all is good. Okay, first, the firewall increase, uh, requires, um, has its own performance requirement. So it potentially increases your swap problems. Um, it doesn't protect the edge, so people get on the platform. It may actually increase your tax service because there's no, more software that's, of course, buggy. Don't think for a second your firewalls aren't buggy. Um, and, of course, a firewall is no help if you use valid messages to um, exploit bugs at the other end. 
because you may exercise some edge cases or some unforeseen combination of um, commands or whatever. Um, and the firewall itself runs on a vulnerable operating system, so you can just compromise that operating system and the firewall's irrelevant. And in the end, firewalls treat symptoms. And of course, it's a great business model for the firewall manufacturers because they, their business model is based on not solving the problem. And um, it's, it, it's a nice money earner because of course you have to upgrade your firewall all the time with every new exploit detected, et cetera. Nice. I, I'm actually working on putting them out of business, but don't tell anyone. <clears throat> All right, so the latest trend is machine learning. So let's throw a neural network on there that detects when the system is compromised by sort of monitoring activities and um, basically taking sort of fingerprints of what's going on in the system and comparing them with what's expected. Okay. First off, this is an admission of failure because you're trying to detect a, the, that the system is compromised, so it's already there. Um, which means, okay, if someone compromises the system, and particularly the operating system on which your um, machine learning or your, your neural network is running on, then of course you can just bypass it. So this is not, it's an admission of defeat, it's not a solution either. All right, so, how, what, what would a real solution look like? So we, we cannot get away from the software complexity. And for the foreseeable future, we can't expect to get software right, not, not huge software stacks. So there, there is an inherent problem in that we have to live with the fact that a lot of the software is buggy and can be compromised. So the, what we need to do is make sure that we protect the really critical assets of the system. So that the logical view of that is you have a lot of software, some of it is truly sensitive, critical. For example, the thing that controls the steering and the brakes and the airbags and whatever and others is necessarily funct necessary functionality, but not critical for the core safety of the system, the survival of the passengers, whatever. And the only way for dealing with this complexity challenge is to identify the really critical bits, pull them out, and protect them from failures in the rest of the system. And of course, the only, this only helps if the critical bits can be made dependable. And because of we have this inherent complexity problem of software, that means inherently you have to keep them small and apply whatever techniques to reduce the, the failure rates and ideally get rid of them. This isolation requires then an operating system which you can trust to provide this isolation. So you have to have an architecture that identifies and pulls out the critical assets and provides strong isolations from the rest of the system which you know will sooner or later be compromised. And then um, the job of the operating system is to provide this isolation and provide controlled communication between those. So this is a very high level view. Um, and what my pitch is essentially about this trustworthy operating system which we call SEL4, which is designed for doing exactly that. So, okay, how can we possibly have a trustworthy operating system that provides dependable isolation? Well, I really apologize of the, about the font issue here. So, my claim is you need actual proof. You, you don't need any hand-waving um, safety cases, you need real proof. So to me, a software, a system is only trustworthy if it can basically show with the claim of mathem with the strength of mathematical proof that it actually behaves according to specification. And any testing or code inspection also can only show the lack of trustworthiness but not trustworthiness. Okay, so how does such a proof look like? Well, I'm not gonna show you the proof. Um, that would be particularly excessively boring but I, uh, I'm trying to explain how the whole process works. 
This is what we've done with SEL4 where we have such a proof. So SEL4 is a microkernel, an operating system microkernel that's implemented in C like any real operating system and um, it's about 10,000 lines of code. So remember the rule of thumb, 10,000 would give you of the order of 10 to 50 bucks, which is way too many. Um, if you, with this kind of code size, if you put a lot of effort in, you could possibly reach the point where you can convince yourself that there's probably no bugs left. But unless you have an actual proof, you never know. So in order to do have a proof of that has some meaning, we actually need a specification. So there is a, what we call the abstract model, which is an operational specification of the kernel functionality in a mathematical logic called higher order logic. And then we have a machine checked proof that shows that the C implementation is a correct implementation of this high, um, high level abstract model, which means that under the C semantics, C of course doesn't have a well-defined semantics, I'm getting there, but let's assume for a second it had a well-defined semantics. A semantics is really a given mathematical meaning to, um, to some language. And so given the semantics, I can convert the C program in a representation in this mathematical logic. And then I show that a so-called refinement proof, which says that any behavior that can be exhibited by the C program under the C semantics is captured or allowed by the abstract model. So in that sense, any, the set of possible behaviors of the C program is a subset of the set of possible behaviors allowed by the abstract model. And in that sense, that's mathematically called a, I'm getting feedback here, um, a, a refinement. And we have done this proof for our SEL4 kernel. So we have a, a, this abstract spec, which is a thousand lines or something like that. And then we have the proof that um, the C code actually satisfies that spec. At this stage, we're still at the mercy of two things. A, our assumption on the C semantics. As I said, C doesn't have a well-defined semantics and we had to narrow it down to a defined subset. And B, I'm at the mercy of the compiler and um, we're using GCC and of course GCC is just as a peak as uh, um, Linux and um, will, can be expected to have similar number of bugs. So that would be rather uncomfortable. So what we have then instead is also a proof that the binary that runs on the actual silicon is again a refinement of the C code. In that sense, it's been translated correctly into C. And the, the, the binary, the, in order to do that, we need to give a, semantic, a, a meaning to the binary and we get that by using a formal model of the ARM ISA that's done at Cambridge and um, in col collaboration with ARM. There's no guarantee that it's correct, but it's um, thoroughly validated and they're actually working on verifying it against the um, Verilog or whatever they use. So with this um, caution that we depend obviously on having a correct model of the hardware, um, we now have a proof chain that says, okay, the, the binary that runs on the silicon correctly implements this abstract spec. That itself, that's very nice. It means we have no implementation box. It doesn't mean that the abstract spec is any good. It could um, allow all sorts of bad behavior, which we don't want. So there's a third level of proof from high level isolation properties, the classical CIA pro um, properties of um, pe people define security with. And we have proofs that our abstract model is able to enforce confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so this whole chain of proofs taken together gives us a very strong statement about the ability of our kernel at the binary level to enforce security. There is some, for truth in advertising, there is some restriction in this story still. We haven't verified the initialization of the kernel, which is sort of background work, but it's technically very boring, so no one is too keen to spend too much time on it. Um, at the moment, things like the MMUs are modeled at a somewhat higher level than the um, 
actual ISA, but we are actively working on closing that one. Um, we have a high-performance multi-core implementation of SEL4, but the multi-core version is not verified. So we, at the moment, strictly, we only have guarantees as long as you're running on one core. And um, the formalism knows nothing about time, and therefore, it can't reason about uh, temple properties like timing channels, etc. cetera. But um, this modular those restrictions, we have an extremely strong story about security enforcement in the system, way beyond what any other operating system has. So these are a few things what this actually means. So the fact that the kernel cannot have any undefined behavior because every behavior it exhibits must be allowed by the spec eliminates all these classical security failures you get in systems like Linux or Windows, et cetera. So we provably have no buffer overflows, no um, reference of undefined pointers or variables, no possibility of code injections, no memory leaks, the kernel can never crash, um, no other undefined behavior, privilege escalation or anything, yes? It's underneath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is. Um, All right. Um, so where would I put that on the car? Is what you mean? So wherever I have any significant amount of functionality. Really, anything that's a process of with an MMU on the system should have should be running SEL4 because when you, you obviously have a lot of software components there and you, you need to have them isolated. In particular, anything that talks to anything that's critical, so anything that interfaces with the CAN bus or with any other um, critical functionality, anything that has drivers that contain um, critical devices should run on such a system. Correct. So, okay, well, what happens if I have a bloody, uh, a buggy Bluetooth stack? Of course I will have a bloody, sorry, a buggy Bluetooth stack. <laughs> that was totally unintended. Um, because it's too complex to get right, right? So I encapsulate it, so someone who compromised the Bluetooth stack can obviously put garbage on the network, yes, and put out garbage the other side, but you, at least you can't directly compromise the rest of the system with it. If your Bluetooth stack runs in the operating system kernel, you already have control over the system. If the Bluetooth stack runs in a isolated domain, you still can cause damage, and then it becomes part of a, a security architecture to limit that damage, but at least you don't automatically control the rest of the system. Because the Bluetooth stack is just a normal user. Huh? No, the, the, proof for my, the proof for my operating system kernel still holds. So this is then, okay, question is, if, if we have this compromised component, what do we know about the rest of the system? So this is a question of what properties do you need to establish safety or security of your overall system? And on which components do you need to depend for these to establish these properties? And if you have a good security architecture, and that's not trivial, obviously, um, then you should be able to identify which are your critical components on which you depend, and you should verify those ideally, or at least have a um, extremely thorough process of um, establishing their trustworthiness. Now, you should never completely be dependent on a Bluetooth stack. And, uh, and if you do it right, the worst your Bluetooth stack can do is denial of service, because you only get to feed it encrypted data and then it can't violate your system integrity or confidentiality, it can only close a communication channel. And that's what you get with a decent security architecture. Obviously, there's components which are critical that run on top, like some of the device drivers, some control code, etc. And this is where, yes, you need to put a lot of effort in to get them right, but the point is, by encapsulating them in their own isolated security domain, 
you know that they can't be um, compromised by another component. They can only be compromised by themselves. So you can um, verify them in isolation or at least sort of put a lot of effort in to make sure that they have some approximation of trustworthiness. So that's the basic argument, right? You, you, in, in the end, you pl play a performance versus security trade-off because by making individual protected components smaller, you make it easier to assure them, but then you, every component boundary has a cost when you cross it, and so if you have too fine-grained an architecture, you may have too much performance issues. So, but that, that comes down to really designing your system right, but the, the most important thing is to keep your critical components as small as possible, basically the old argument of minimizing your trusted computing base. Okay, so this actually works. Just one sec, yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, No, you, you, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the question is basically, what's the vulnerability of not having initialization um, verified? It is a real issue because if something goes wrong during initialization, now, the assumption is during initialization there's no external interference, so you can't mess with the system at that stage. So the real danger is that the system gets initialized in an unsafe state, where you then, which you then can exploit. And, um, it's actually happened. We had a kernel for a long time that had a bug in the initialization code where on certain hardware, it would boot up into an unsafe state which you could exploit from user level and basically you could trigger user code by executing the right operations, could at any time, so under complete control of the user code, crash the kernel. So basically a denial of service attack on the system. Um, the, the takeaway from this one is any code that's not verified is, has to be assumed buggy, which is basically what I said before. Right? And um, the, 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 the lesson for us was, yes, we really have to verify this. <laughs> so the, the hardware root of trust helps you in attesting that the right system is running. So this is part of the overall security story, right? You need that to make sure that no one has tampered with the system because only if I know that this is the right SEL4 binary running on the system can I be sure that it does the right thing. If it's something else, then all, all bets are off. So um, secure boot, etc., cetera, are necessary pieces in the overall puzzle. It's just not our work. You, you, need, you need that to, for a verified operating system to make sense because otherwise um, you could be running anything. So um, it's definitely an important part, but um, it's, it's, there's all thought and other people working on that, right? So it's not, we, we don't have to solve that problem. Okay, yeah? So, uh, okay, the, 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 I'm not sure I understood the question, but it, it's got to, to do with um, how meaningful the abstract model is or what? I mean, our abstract model is actually fairly low level because it is an exact operational semantics. For, so basically for every system call, it specifies exactly how the kernel will behave. And so it, it is fairly detailed. And um, as I said, yes, the, the, this could specify some behavior which is totally um, at odds with any security. For example, it could say that whoever has right access to this magic page 
can increase their privilege level or something like that, right? That would be obviously a very bad design. So this is why we have this um, top level proof hierarchy that show that the system will actually enforce isolation. So these are some of the things where actually L4 has been running on. So there was this um, DARPA HackEMS program where we re retrofitted existing military vehicles. So the left one is an uh, autonomous helicopter or an optionally piloted because the FIA won't allow them to fly it autonomously. Um, an optionally piloted helicopter built by Boeing. And um, the, it's public knowledge, it's an on uh, basically, there, there was a, an, a red team in the DARPA project and it took them like two weeks to own that thing, which is sort of interesting given that it's a military vehicle. And um, so the, the interesting part, bit about this work was we took an existing system. It had all its um, mission control board running on a Linux system, Shada, and um, no surprise, it was attackable and we re-architected, or the Boeing people with our help, re-architected that system and pulled out, they did exactly what I described, pulled out the critical components, run them in isolated SEL4 domain, left the big legacy stuff running, stack running in Linux. In the end, the, the final system actually had two Linux virtual machines that contained some of the legacy um, functionality. And um, we, for the final demo, they had an in-flight demo where they showed an in-flight attack where the, the threat model was basically the, the Linux system gets compromised. There were two particular threat models, so no point getting into that. But basically, um, we gave full access, root access to the attacker and they couldn't interfere with the vehicle operation. They could shut down the part of this functionality that was running in Linux, which in this case was the camera feed. Um, so they, they could take over the camera feed and send down to the base station whatever they wanted, but they could not affect the rest of the system. They tried fork bombs and um, whatever, um, fuzzing, et cetera, and couldn't get out. And similarly, the, the other thing is uh, autonomous US Army trucks. They're actually driving around Detroit without drivers, and we retrofitted them in a similar way. Um, this is a military multi-level secure terminal so-called cross-domain devices, where on a single terminal you get windows that are displaying data from different networks with different security classification uh, securely in a way that no, no, inform no un unauthorized information flow is possible between the networks. And the only authorized information flow, if it's enabled, is a cut and paste by the human operator. And this is a crypto stick that's under security evaluation by GCHQ in the UK for um, certifying it for military use. And there's other stuff in the, in the pipeline. Any questions up to this point? Yes. Well, it is the operating system. <laughs> It can in principle, it's just very expensive. And the biggest payoff is for the operating system because the operating system is reusable. You do it once and you can use it forever. Um, for applications, that cost is much less justifiable. If you ask me, yes, it should be done for all the critical components and provided the component is not too big, there's no reason why it couldn't be done. But so, um, no, labor, mostly labor. So there, there's no performance cost. When we started this project, um, my word to the team was I will not consider this a success if we lose more than 10% in IPC performance. So that's the critical message passing operation. And when we had the first proof finished, we were right at this 10% boundary. By now, the verified kernel is faster than any kernel we built before, and we had be the fastest kernels forever. Um, so that there's no inherent performance cost, but it's, it is an expensive manual process. Um, to give you rough order of magnitude, um, Green Hills years ago st stated to take an operating system to 
security certification, the whole lifecycle cost is about $1,000 per line of code. Um, our cost was of the order of $300 per line of code for much stronger assurance. We have actual guarantees. Now, our actual cost was significantly lower, but there was student slave labor, so we inflated that to reflect grown-ups. Um, and the other data point is uh, our predecessor kernel, where Chuck sitting there in the back had a lot of his hands in, um, it was done in a, developed in a very similar environment by similarly people with similar, who similarly knew what they were doing, et cetera. And the development cost of that one was somewhere between $100 and $150 per line of code, which tells you we're already cheaper than classical approaches to high assurance software that gives you no guarantees, but we are more, about a factor of two or three more expensive than traditionally engineered software. And from the research point of view, our main effort at the moment is to reduce this cost gap. Um, and we've actually, we've probably brought it down already by, a fa by half. So we're probably less than five years away from the break, even point where verified software in the right scale is no more expensive than traditionally engineered software. And at which point you, there will be no excuse not to do it. Any other questions at this point? Please ask now, as I said, I'll run off after. Um, okay, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about mixed criticality because besides the um, assurance story, this is also th something that is unique in SEO4 and particularly relevant for autonomous operation. And that's the issue of mixed criticality. And what I mean is basically what I said before, the, the coexistence of um, more, totally critical with less critical functionality on the same processor. And at the, so far I talked about basically spatial isolation, so memory safety. But there is, of course, in cyber physical system, there's equally important is a temporal safety. You need to be able to guarantee deadlines. And this is what's called, what's classified as this mixed criticality real-time system, where you have critical real-time functionality, which absolutely needs to meet its deadlines, running on the same platform with untrusted code, which you must stop from um, affecting the ability of the critical code to meet its deadlines. So this is a very highly simplified example. You have some control loop, which is of course the critical bit, and you have a network driver. And the control loop will typically execute something of a, at a 10 or 20 hertz rate, so relatively um, infrequent. And then you have a network driver which needs to serve a network and ideally without dropping packets, and your network gives you interrupts in the um, worst case interrupt rates of the order of one per microsecond or so. So the classical approach to these um, mixed criticality system is strict time and space partitioning. So you basically um, do, you t you do uh, time multiplexing, give every partition a fixed um, time slice during which it operates, and um, that way, ensure that um, there's no temporal interference. And this is, for example, what the ARINC 753, I think, standard prescribes for avionics. Um, this is fine, except for any half complex system, it's just not good enough. And this simple example shows you why. In order to give good service to the network and avoid dropping packets, you have to serve interrupts relatively frequently. So just having this fixed time and space partitioning means when the control loop is operating every 100 milliseconds and you give it, say, a 10 millisecond slice, then that means for 10 milliseconds you can't serve any interrupts. And therefore, you'll lose a lot of um, interrupts. So you should, the network driver should be allowed to preempt the critical functionality but in a controlled fashion without affecting the ability of the, the critical functionality to meet its deadlines. So this means you have to um, support a mode where something runs at higher priority, but still 
um, you can guarantee enough service time to something running at lower priority. So <clears throat> that's one aspect of the challenge. And if, if that was the only thing, you could, might as well use Linux because it has these mechanisms. The other aspect of challenge is that in these mixed criticality systems, you inherently have sharing. So again, a very oversimplified example is you have your vehicle control, you have your navigation system. Obviously, the navigation system is less critical because um, as long as you don't drive into trees or other cars or something, if you get the navigation wrong, you may use the, uh, a less efficient route, but it's not going to cause major damage. And the human can, in the end, interfere. Um, but the point is, these are not completely independent. They have to share data. For example, there is data on what the vehicle is doing, where it is, um, where it's moving, where it should be moving, etc. And in particular, the navigation will update this data. And the vehicle control needs to access it. And it's important that the vehicle control only ever sees a, a consistent snapshot of that data. It doesn't necessarily need to, it's not necessarily, it's not necessary to guarantee that it always sees the latest version, but it needs to see a consistent version at any circumstance. So how do you do that? The typical, safest, easiest way is to just encapsulate the shared data, could be code as well, into a server that is invoked by both um, these other components. So the control invokes the server, the navigation invokes the server. They do this via a message passing interface, and the server itself is single-threaded, and that itself guarantees mutual exclusion. So um, the, the server can only let in the control code if the navigation code is not presently executing in the server, and therefore the control code is guaranteed to always see a consistent uh, set of data, provided the navigation code doesn't leave it inconsistent. So this is part of the security assumptions here. This is all fine. The problem is, um, what if, ah, the, the, the setup actually has some really nice properties as far as real-time theory concerned because it implements what's called the um, immediate priority ceiling protocols, which, which basically is a, one of the established way of limiting priority inversion. Um, so it, it prevents basically um, a low priority process being stuck in there and blocking out a higher priority um, process for an indefinite amount of time. So it's got, got a lot of nice properties and therefore it's, it's a good thing to do. And then the, the basic message here is this is really a good design because it automatically gives you all these nice properties for free. Okay, the problem with this is then, well, if I have this server that's running as a process in the system, and I have a client that invokes it, so by sending a message, requesting it to do some work, the server is running. Part of the idea behind this priority ceiling protocol is the server runs at higher priority. This gives you the, um, all these nice pro uh, properties about the, the, doing the real-time locking correctly. And so the server runs at higher priority, can't be preempted by any of the clients, and then it responds back. And if this client is malicious, it will just invoke the server again and just keep it busy in a busy loop. And so this client therefore basically denies service to another client by just keeping the, ser uh, the server busy because it itself consumes almost no computing time. So the, the schedule will just happily reschedule it. So that this is a, an, a case where sort of normal operating systems don't provide you enough temporal isolation. The, 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 the client one, assume client two is the high critical one, client one can basically um, mount a denial of service attack against the other client. So what we want for these real-time systems is not only certifiable spatial isolation, but also equal strength temporal isolation. And this is what, um, uh, SEO4 gives you as well. So basically guarantee real-time um, deadlines for the critical things without making any assumption about the well-behavedness of the less critical ones. Uh, 
And this basically gives you high utilization because you can reuse Slack, et cetera. So the way we do this in SEO4 is we, we used to have something, just uh, simple scheduling parameters of priority and time slice, like a lot of operating systems have them. We now have a new concept called a scheduling context and a client needs to have a, a capability and access token to such as scheduling context. If it doesn't have one, it can't run. And the scheduling context, among others, encapsulates a period and a budget. And what this says is the system, unless something higher priority prevents it, will sh execute this process once every period, but don't allow, it doesn't allow it to run more than its budget. So if the, um, that, that basically limits CPU bandwidths. So if you have, for example, a scheduling context with a period of three and a budget of two, then this process cannot consume more than two thirds of all available CPU time. And if there's another one with a period of 1,000 and a um, budget of 250, then this can consume at most a, a quarter. And this might be sort of a representation of our mixed criticality system, the one with the Short period is the high priority one because it needs to be able to preempt the um, low priority one, which might be the critical one. But in total, over the total period, it cannot consume more than two thirds of the CPU time. And therefore, we can guarantee enough time is left for the lower priority thing that runs at a, high, at a lower rate. And that's the, the basic isolation mechanism required. Yep. Okay, so it, it's got a budget of two thirds, but that means there's always one third time left over. Over over every time window of three time units, there's always um, one time unit left over for other things. And it, this assumes you have properly accounted for preemption um, overheads, etc. Um, if you have that, you know there's one third left for use by other things, which is enough to satisfy the low priority process. Yeah. No, it's it's not only from the throughput; it's also its deadline. So this thing, the other one, the the low priority one that runs at this um, low rate of once every thousand time units, can get up to 333 time units in that window, and that's more than it needs. Again, this is not rocket science. Linux has something similar, but it doesn't have the other thing we have, which is what you actually need for this shared server scenario, which I talked about. Um, okay, here's just a simple example, which basically says the same thing. So you have a medium criticality, but short period, and therefore high priority process that is allowed up to 10% utilization, which means even though this is the highest priority job in the system, we know that 90% of CPU time is still available for other things, and the high criticality, lower priority only needs worst case 50%, so it has enough to get service. And there we can guarantee its deadline. So the, the thing that's actually key to making this whole thing useful is the ability to apply to shared servers. So in this case, we have the same scenario as before, two clients uh, invoking a shared server that hunt, runs at highest priority. The first client invokes a server. Now in this case, it actually has to pass on its scheduling context. The server doesn't have a scheduling context of its own, so it can only run on the client's scheduling context. And that means the time consumed by the server on behalf of the client is built to the client. And if the server returns its result back to the client, the scheduling context migrates back and now the server time has been properly accounted. And it's no longer possible to run this denial of service attack between clients as I described before because the, the server time is properly accounted for. And this is the key ingredient you need to reason about timeliness on the system. The other key ingredient of course is the, the worst case execution time analysis of the kernel itself um, which we have for SEL4. Um, and then the question is, okay, what do you do if the server runs out of budget, which is really a protocol violation by the client? 
Um, well, there's various, various to address this. There's a system out there called Composite, which basically forces servers to be multi-threaded, which basically defeats the purpose of having my shared server because I use it for mutual exclusion. So that doesn't really solve the problem. Other people believe in bandwidth inheritance, which basically means you have the waiting client pay for the protocol violation of the other client, which I don't think is the right way to do either. Um, in typical microkernel fashion, we punt the problem to the user and say, we just give you the mechanism, we give you a timeout, and you can decide on your own policy of how to deal with it. And a typical policy might be, for example, to just drop the client request, roll back the server, or you may shoot down the client or whatever. Yes? So, okay, the, the, the question was basically, how, how, long, how, how do you know how long something takes? And this is the domain of worst case execution time analysis. So in any real time system, in principle, you have to have a worst case execution time analysis. You have to know how long your things run for. And in a mixed criticality system, that means you, know, you need to know the worst case time requirements of your high, highly critical processes, not the low one. We have the mechanisms to protect the high ones from the low ones. Uh, and you need to know the worst case execution time of the kernel itself, which we also know for ACL4. Um, and it, it's actually, to best of my knowledge, um, the only operating system kernel in the open literature with a sound and complete worst case execution time analysis. So we have the information about the kernel to ensure that. So basically, this allows us to take into account preemption costs and all that stuff. And that includes cache analysis, et cetera. So you can do that. It's not trivial, particularly for non-trivial systems, but it's doable. You look very um, non-convinced. <laughs> Because they couldn't analyze them, sure. So you can count every clock cycle, and then you get to where you got $10 in cash, and that cash would be tasks. Well, you don't have to run 10,000 critical tasks. You may typically have a small number of them, and the low ones, hey? Three, yeah, and you can do that. Um, I mean, there's basically two ways in industry to do worst case execution time analysis. The one is used by a microkernel that's been used widely in automotive, comes from somewhere in Canada. Um, and I've seen the reports and they do basically put a load on measure interrupt latencies, apply a fudge factor, and <coughs> declare that your worst case execution time analysis. I would not want to be in a system whose real time safety depends on that. And then there's other people who do a sound analysis, which tends to be extremely pessimistic. Um, basically using static analysis, doing what you say, counting instructions, and um, on, a, on a modern micro, pipeline microprocessors with caches, that's fairly non-trivial. That's why there's few systems out there that have that. Um, but but we, these tools exist, and we applied them to SEL4. It wasn't trivial. We had to do a lot of work for them to scale to the size of SEL4, but it's doable. And in principle, you have to do the same thing for your critical user-level tasks, sure. Yep, I'm on my last slide, I think, almost. Um, I, I've got some um, bragging about performance, uh, which is fine. I think this, this slide is the interesting one. Uh, it shows, this is a setup that basically represents this case I talked about earlier. We have a high priority CPU hog and a low priority critical task that in this case does networking, so we just uh, measure network um, packet latencies. Uh, the x-axis is the budget we give to the CPU hog, so it will run for as long as we let it. The, um, the green line shows the CPU, what this budget is. Um, so if you, that, that basically shows how much time is taken by this uh, CPU hog, and the Blue line is the mean and the red line the max network latency. 
and we can see that the, the worst case network latency measured is exactly the budget we give to the high priority CPU hog. So, which basically shows that, and the lines are beautifully straight. There are error bars on there, which you can't see because they're so small. Um, and it, it just shows that the system actually limits the interference by the high priority process on the low priority process by observing that the worst case latency is exactly the budget of the high priority one. We can also do implement different stuff at user level, which, um, I don't need to get into any detail and get back to my summary, which um, shows basically autonomous systems, and this applies to cars as well as autonomous aircraft. They are inherently mixed, critical, mixed criticality systems, and we need operating system technology to um, support that. And that includes not only strict spatial, but also temporal isolation which SEO Foot provides with the um, strength of mathematical proof. At the moment, uh, the proof applies to the spatial isolation properties, but the temporal isolation proper proofs, um, they are in progress. And with that, I thank you for your attention.